Good morning. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 McGovern Spring Symposium meeting on transfor transformational strategies in mental health. Um, I'll just share a personal note that a couple of years ago I um, had uh, oral surgery for cancer, which is, I'm okay. It somewhat affected my speech, uh, uh, but I hope I can share a message with you effectively. Uh, this meeting is co-organized by the Poitras Center for Psychiatric Disorders Research, the Wellcome Trust, McLean Hospital, and MIT's Open Learning. Um, a lot went into preparing this meeting, for, and I'm, I want to just share gratitude uh, to the, Jim and Pat Poitras for their generous creation of the Poitras Center that made this meeting possible. Individuals at MIT who made a great effort over the past year to plan this meeting, including Cara Flynn, Sarah Frank, and Gail Lucian from the McGovern Institute, from Open Learning, Tom Smith and Peter Kaufman, and from our partnering hosts, uh, Welcome Trust, and Ferry, Niall Boyce, and Taylor McLeod, and from McLean, Gus Dogwood. I thank the outstanding scientists who are pretending, presenting today for their time to, part in, to participate, you, the audience, uh, who come to listen in person and online. We look forward to a day of important ideas and valuable exchanges. So, um, Many of you might have seen the movie Oppenheimer, right? Okay, yeah. The Manhattan Project, where scientists, amazing physicists, were brought together to accomplish what seemed like an impossible scientific goal. They had a morally ambiguous agenda, the creation of the atomic bomb, right? Uh, we don't. We just want to make lives safer and better for children, adolescents, and adults, the friends who worry about them, the families that love them. That's all we want to do, okay? We do not have moral ambiguity in what our goal is. But we face a challenge of complexity and urgency not unlike the Manhattan Project, right? Uh, well, you know about this very well. Many of you are experts in this and highly knowledgeable. You know, we've had incredibly little progress on the scientific side of mental health research that makes a difference in the lives of patients. Uh, shocking a little. And I say this as somebody who's worked in the field for a while, so you know, I'm, I'm one of them also who's you know, surprised at how little progress we've had translating science into better lives for patients and families. And so uh, with the same kind of urgency, I think, that the Manhattan Project had to accomplish what they did, you know, I think all of us speaking today are having this meeting in, part, you know, in large part because we feel that same urgency now uh, to do something uh, on the basis of science that will make lives much, much better for so many people. And we know that mental health uh, issues are not only very difficult, but on a steady basis in the United States and in many other countries, becoming worse year by year in numbers of people suffering. So you know, we have the same uh, urgency to do something together as a community of scientists and, and, and partners of all kinds uh, to make a difference uh, uh, for something that we think is so important, so pressing, and so challenging. So um, I'm going to ask uh, our, our, our partner, uh, Niall uh, uh, Boyce, to come up and say a few words on behalf of uh, the co-host of this conference, uh, the Welcome Foundation. Trust. Welcome, Trust. Good morning. Thank you all for coming here. Uh, today, uh, my name is Niall Boyce. I'm head of field building in mental health at Wellcome. What field, field building is, I will leave you in suspense because we are going to talk about that later. So that is something for you to look forward to. But uh, in gratitude uh, to you all for, for coming along to this meeting and uh, for those watching online, I'm going to start off by giving you the benefit of uh, almost 20 years in the business of mental health clinically and in research and in publishing. I'm going to tell you the secret, everything I know about mental health, and it'll be short because it's two words. It's complex. There you go. And I think some people see this complexity as being a bad thing, because uh, if you think about the many things which contribute to mental health problems, the, the genetic, the neurological, the molecular, uh, the social, uh, these days the digital, it can seem overwhelmingly complex. It can seem like something that's so complex we've got no idea how to start unpicking it. But I see the complexity as actually being a good thing in some ways, as being a benefit. Because mental health is such a complex science, it means that 
everyone in every branch of science, perhaps in every walk of life, has something to contribute to the problems which we face and which we are attempting to untangle and to solve for the benefit, as John said, of uh, individuals who are suffering and their loved ones and their families and their friends. Now, I'd like to pick up on something uh, else which John said, which was that uh, we, we haven't done fantastically well in mental health science, uh, that we haven't got the results which we would have liked to get. And I certainly think about this. You know, when I was in practice, uh, what were the treatments which I could offer people? Well, we had uh, antipsychotics uh, from the 1950s. We had uh, lithium from the 1940s, ECT from the 1930s. Uh, if we were being really modern, we had CBT from the 1960s and antidepressants uh, from the 1980s. So these were treatments which, and I was working in the, in the early 2000s, so th these are treatments really which uh, had not changed, had not developed uh, often for decades. Now I know there's a lot of criticism from outside of uh, psychiatry, from outside of mental health science about uh, the scientific approach, about the medical approach to mental health problems. And sometimes that criticism can be very intense and often that criticism is very unfair. But I think that what we shouldn't do is be too defensive in response to that criticism. We need to accept that we do not always get the outcomes that we want. That, uh, to take an example, uh, if uh, we have someone with a first episode of psychosis and we give them an antipsychotic, uh, we know that uh, four in five will improve, one in five won't. Uh, we know that if the person needs clozapine, if they need to, to move over to uh, the, the most effective, but, but in some ways quite a risky medication, uh, we know from statistics that sometimes people can wait for as long as nine years before they're given clozapine. So that's nine years of uh, symptoms, uh, very distressing symptoms, side effects, but no effective treatment before they get the clozapine. So, the, in that case, you could say we need more, more effective medications. We also need to have medications which are targeted properly uh, to the right people at the right time. Antidepressants, similarly, we get about a 50% response rate. That sounds pretty good until you realize the placebo gets you about 35%. So we do need to do better. And we shouldn't let, uh, as I say, fierce and sometimes unfair criticism hinder us from self-criticism and from that drive to do better. And uh, we are at a moment, I think, of, of great opportunity, as, as John said. Um, when I started uh, work at The Lancet, uh, when I moved from practice to, to publishing in 2010, uh, mental health was pretty much a backwater. Uh, there wasn't much money in it. There wasn't a lot of attention uh, paid to it. It was often used as, as a bit of a joke, really. And in the past 15 years, I've seen that transform completely. You will you barely open a newspaper these days without some story about mental health. Now, it's been very gratifying to see this increased degree of interest. However, I think we would be fooling ourselves if we think that this degree of interest will maintain and improve and continue indefinitely. We are at a moment of opportunity. Uh, I feel that there's a great deal of public sympathy with us. Um, in uh, the Wellcome Trust, as you'll learn, we have made a great financial commitment towards mental health research. But we need to bear in mind that this particular wave of enthusiasm and attention is not something that's going to last forever, and we need to capitalize on it, and we need to capitalize on it now. Now, I was going to end uh, talking to you with an inspirational quote, but unfortunately, my uh, favorite 20th century author is um, Samuel Beckett, who is um, a great Irish author and therefore not in the business of inspirational quotes. Uh, <laughs> However, there was something he said which I think is appropriate to our situation. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. So with that as perhaps not our goal, but certainly a realistic assessment of the situation, that we do need to try things, we do need to fail, we do need to fail better, and I believe that ultimately we will succeed. So with that in mind, I will hand you back to John for our first talk. Thank you very much.